Today, I want to bring back some of those good old Game Boy memories and play a little game with you. But I have to warn you, this game is far less innocent than Tetris. It takes place in one of the absolute worst places on the planet. It is hell on Earth. If you're a millennial, with a bit of decision stress, trying to do something about climate change, I call this place the Cave of Consumer Traps. Now, you've probably been to this place before, maybe even hundreds of times. You just know by different name. The Supermarket. <laughs> Which is a terrible name, because there is nothing super about it. But before we go in there, we need to choose our character. Ah, this guy looks a bit too nervous. It's cute, but no, not really my thing. Ah. That's more like it. Let's go with Frank, a naive Dutch guy with typical millennial issues such as FOMO. When Frank was about 15 years old, he first learned about the horrible and unfair effects of climate change. And ever since then, he's been trying to find ways to do something about it. Like most people, for a really long time, Frank only heard about all the problems and had no idea about the solutions until he found this book, Drawdown where scientists calculate the 100 most effective ways to reduce emissions. And, oh, by the way, his favorite food is hamburgers. So, Frank is not a chef, but he decides to make a cookbook for climate change, to make it easier for himself and his friends to be part of this food solution. So he goes deep down the rabbit hole of climate change and food, and that's where we start the game. By the way, if you haven't noticed yet, I'm Frank. <laughs> okay, let's do this. I press start and the screen turns black and then I hear the old game room music and Frank walks into the cave. The objective is simple enough. I just need to find some coconut milk so Frank can make a curry for his friends. So I work my way through the aisles, but then I stop. This game? It's about climate change, and isn't there a lot of damage for flying coconut milk halfway around the world? Maybe it's a trap. But wait, most of the things from far away, they come by boats, so the emissions per product are really low, so it's fine. Okay, just continue. I turn around the corner, and there I spotted the coconut milk. But nobody told me that there would be 13 different kinds of coconut milk. How am I supposed to choose? Okay, can or carton? What's inside usually makes a bigger difference than the packaging. Okay, can is fine, maybe organic. But then next to it, there's another option, fair trade. Oh, I'm trying to solve this riddle when, to my left, I see an old woman walking towards me, staring at me. She is definitely judging if I can pass this test. <laughs> okay, if you want to save the world, you've got to at least choose the right coconut milk. I'm sweating, my heart is pounding, and the woman keeps staring. I feel like Tom Cruise has to cut the red or the black cable, and if I choose the wrong one, the whole thing is going to explode. Organic, fair trade, organic, fair trade. I close my eyes and choose a can. It's organic. And then, silence. Nothing happens. The store doesn't explode and the woman walks on. I quickly head for the exit and take another look at my can. What if, what if not buying the fair trade option means that the farmers can't buy food for their children and they have to leave the village in a storm to catch fish and then the boat capsizes and they all die? Oh, what have I done? But well, it's too late. I pay and head out in the cold night. How am I ever going to give people advice about eating sustainably? I can't even get it right myself. Sure, I made it out alive, but this is not what winning looks like. This feels like game over. So I walk back home with my coconut milk, and I feel small and powerless. What can one person do about climate change? Despite having a few more moments like this, I continue working on the book. And slowly, I start to connect the dots and see the bigger picture. Maybe it's possible to break down this huge challenge into smaller steps. In a video game, you also don't start by fighting the end boss. You work your way through all the different levels so your character gains more and more experience until you're strong enough to take on the final mission. So Frank needs to go level by level. What might be those first couple of levels of food and climate change? The biggest problem is definitely meat, but oh, come on, becoming a vegetarian? That's not a small step. Isn't there some kind of entry level? Let's see. 
If we take all the world's wild birds and mammals, including the ones from the sea, like dolphins and whales, and then on top of that, we add all the world's chickens, sheep, goats, horses, and pigs, the weight of all of these animals combined, it's less than the weight of all cows in the world. Planet Earth, it's more like planet cow. No wonder we have to cut down forests to feed all of them. And on top of that, cows also burp methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. So I know what level one is, replacing beef. And you don't even have to replace it with tofu. One research calculated that if you replace beef with pork or chicken, so you're not even eating less meat, just a different kind of meat, this could already reduce your footprint of your food by 21%. Now, of course, replacing all beef with chicken is not really the end goal of a sustainable diet, but it already makes a huge difference. The overall goal is more about enjoying meat as a luxury product for the weekend. Turning beef into a luxury is a great first step to restore the balance and to tackle the underlying cause of climate change, because beef is a great way to unlearn overconsumption. So, Frank, Reduce this beef, turn this favorite food from hamburgers into curry, and pass to level one. <laughs> the other big problem with food and climate change is food waste. So surely level two must be about food waste. That reminds me of a friend who really doesn't like bread crusts. Whenever she buys a loaf of bread, she was so honest to admit to me, she throws away both crusts. Now, if you came here today, you are probably a super sustainable person who would never do this. But the statistics say that if I were to go to your home and open up the trash bag, I would find a lot of bread. Because one in every five slices is wasted. And worldwide, more than half of all wasted calories come from cereals, like bread or pasta. Of course, we waste a lot more than just bread crusts. But I think eating all those slices is a great solution for climate change. First of all, there was a study that showed that people who eat their bread crusts, they waste less food in general. But for me, bread crusts have an even bigger power. I think they can help us to remember what's most important in life. Yes, you're never going to look at bread crusts the same way again. The reason that we waste so much food in the first place is because, because we've kind of forgotten its value. Food is our first basic need, but it no longer feels that way because it has become part of our efficient factory system. So sometimes it's just cheaper or more convenient to throw it away. And that's where the humble bread cost comes in. Every time you buy a loaf of bread and you open up the bag and you find this dry piece of crust, the symbol of unwanted food, you have a chance to practice a new perspective, to see food as one of the most valuable things in the world, to see food as something priceless. So, Frank developed a new superpower, to eat all the bread crusts that come his way, past level two. Now it starts to get more complicated. What might be level three? Maybe if we have so many cows, I almost don't dare say it, less cheese? I'm not sure I like where this is going. What if I need to become a vegan and live in a tiny house and move far away in the forest? <laughs> of course, that would minimize my footprint, but it would also minimize my interaction with other people. I don't just want to reduce my negative footprint, I want to make a positive impact on the world. Let's see, if replacing beef, re can, if replacing beef can already reduce your footprint by 21%, maybe that means that convincing one other person to also replace beef makes a much bigger difference than the rest of the steps that I still have to take. What if we worry less about making perfectly sustainable decisions by ourselves, and more about hosting sustainable dinner parties. <laughs> Cooking for your friends has this mysterious power. I think maybe it can even help us to change the system. After all, in the ultimate consumer world, cooking is for losers. Instead, 
You just order a complete meal produced in an efficient food factory delivered right to your doorstep. And that kind of makes me feel like one of those people in the movie Wally, -E, <laughs> where all humans live on a huge spaceship because Earth was too polluted. And they drive around in their entertainment chairs and they get their lunch in a cup. And then one day, a robot brings back a small plant to the captain of the ship. And for the first time in his life, he learns about all these magical things like grass and dancing and putting a seed into the ground and getting food from it. They've been living on a spaceship for so long that all their consumer needs are fulfilled, but they've totally forgotten what it means to be human. Now, I don't live on a spaceship like that, but I do live in a concrete jungle full of ads and screens that constantly seduce me to buy more stuff and make my life more convenient, even though that doesn't make me happy at all. If we want to escape this consumer system, we need to replace it with an alternative vision of the good life. We need to focus much more on all the things that money can't buy, from going into nature and having micro-adventures to having dinner parties. Cooking, especially together with other people, cooking, especially together with other people, can lay the foundation of this new version of the good life. We can replace beef and unlearn overconsumption. We can eat our bread crusts and relearn that food is something priceless. So Frank invited his friends over for dinner to make a delicious coconut curry. Past level three. Now, it's time to return to the cave of consumer traps once more and see if Frank is strong enough this time to make it out alive without feeling miserable. Okay, I press start and the screen turns black and then I hear the old game of music and Frank walks into the cave. Here we go. Organic or fair trade? Why can't I just choose coconut milk like a normal person? I want to give up, but no, I can't. Voting between the lesser of two evils is still better than not voting at all. And then, to my left, I see the same old woman walking towards me. What does this woman want from me? I want to ignore her, but then I accidentally catch her eye. Okay, quick, try to smile. <laughs> and then, she smiles back, and she asks me where she can find the cashews. Oh, I, I know that. Just take a right, and at the wine bottles, take a left, and look to the bottom right shelf. Man, I know how to get around in this part of the store. And then it hits me. I know this part of the store with the nuts and beans. I know it much better than the meat aisle. In fact, I can't even remember when I last walked through there. Huh, I must be doing something right. And in fact, today I even had some bread crusts for lunch. And tonight, I'm making a plant-based curry for my friends. Here I am obsessing over which type of coconut milk to buy. Maybe it makes a much bigger difference than I'm standing here in this part of the store buying coconut milk rather than being in the meat aisle buying beef. Okay, I'll take uh, organic for now. It's not like my decision is set in stone. I can always come back and choose fair trade the next time. So I head for the exit and take another look at my can. Sure, it's not perfect, but together with everything else I buy, I think it points in the right direction. It points towards a world where we give back space to nature, farm in harmony with our environment, and pay farmers a fair price. So pay and head out into the cold night, full of fresh air. Ah, the supermarket is still a horrible place, <laughs> with a terrible name. But now I know how to play the game. Frank defeated the cave of consumer traps. So I walk back home with my coconut milk. I walk back home with my coconut milk, and I feel excited that I live in a time where something so mundane as grocery shopping can have such a powerful impact. Three times a day, I can use my food to practice a new version of the good life. Three times a day, I have a chance to vote in what kind of world I want to live. Now I love the hard work of cutting the vegetables and making a huge mess in the kitchen and then serving my very own coconut curry to a group of friends. 
this is what it feels like to be human rather than a consumer. I'm only at the beginning of my journey of cooking for a better world, but I'm so excited about everything that lies ahead. I can't wait to see what's behind those mountains. And who else is going to join me on this adventure? I wish you all the best on your own journey. And may the forks be with you. <laughs> Thank you.